Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We will get started um, around 2.30. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We will get started at 2.30. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Housing and Services Resource Center's webinar. Enhancing Housing Stability for Individuals with Traumatic Brain Injury at Risk for or Experiencing Homelessness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next slide. My name is Lori Gerhardt and I am the Director of the Office for Interagency Innovations at ACL, or the Administration for Community Living. ACL is an operating division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I will be serving as the facilitator for today's webinar. It is a privilege to have so many of you here with us. Your active involvement in this webinar is essential for us to have an engaging discussion. So let's get started. Next slide. We have an exciting agenda today. First, we will review some housekeeping items and then we'll engage in an interactive poll to learn more about your experience in providing services and supports to individuals with traumatic brain injury. We will have several other opportunities to engage with your peers throughout the, this webinar as well, so stay tuned. After we see the results from our poll, we'll hear from Mr. Jeff Larkham, a gentleman living with a traumatic brain injury. He will share a bit of his story with us. Then we will hear from Caitlin Sinovec from the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators who will discuss the prevalence of traumatic brain injury the additional risks for housing instability that individuals with traumatic brain injury experience, and the program services and collaborative efforts that assist those with traumatic brain injury as they look to find a safe, stable home environment with the wraparound supports they need. Next, we'll, we will hear from Michaela Gray from the Brain Injury Alliance in Colorado about one model of inclusive permanent supportive housing to assist individuals with traumatic brain injury. 
We'll hear firsthand how design elements and access to services help to provide a stable environment. Then we've reserved about 20 minutes at the end of this presentation to respond to your questions of our presenters. Please use the Q&A feature throughout the webinar to enter questions for the speakers, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible during the question and answer session. Let's get started. Next slide. First, let's review a few housekeeping items. This meeting is being recorded. By staying to participate, you are consenting to the recording. Also, all attendees have been muted for audio quality. Second, a hallmark of our webinars is active participation from attendees. Please frequently use the chat to make comments. To ask a question of a presenter, please enter your question using the Q&A feature in the Zoom dashboard. Questions can be entered and submitted throughout the webinar. You may also email a question or comment to the Housing and Services Resource Center mailbox, hsrc at acl.hhs.gov. Third, please use the chat or email if you have a technical issue or comment for other attendees. Fourth, tomorrow you will receive an email from Zoom that will include a link to the slides for today's presentation. When the recording is posted, we'll send you another email about how to access it. Next slide. Finally, we'd like to review a few accessibility items. Today, an ASL interpreter will be, will be visible throughout the webinar. You can enlarge the window of the ASL interpreter by using the pin feature. Simply click on the ASL interpreter's window and select the pin icon to make their window larger. To ensure that ASL interpreters will be visible in our webinar recording, we have also asked presenters and panelists to limit use of their own camera visibility only to when they are speaking. If you are using a screen reader and want to silence unwanted chatter in the chat and Q&A boxes, activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert, spacebar, and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Next slide. Now we'd like to learn a little more about your agency's experience in providing services and supports to individuals with traumatic brain injury or TBI. Please provide your best answer to the poll question. It should have popped up on your screen. What is your agency's experience in providing services and supports to individuals with traumatic brain injury or TBI? Your options are, we provide direct services and supports to individuals with TBI, we partner with agencies that provide services and supports to individuals with TBI. We partner with housing agencies that provide supportive housing for individuals with TBI. We are a housing agency that provides supportive housing for individuals with TBI. We are a housing agency that partners with a provider of services and supports to individuals with TBI. We are a housing agency that provides supportive housing but I am unsure how we provide services for individuals with TBI and am interested in learning. None, we do not provide services and supports or partner with agencies that provide them to individuals with TBI or none, I am an individual not associated with an agency. And we'll move on to the next slide while you're um, responding to that poll. I'd like to tell you about the Housing and Services Resource Center or HSRC. This is a partnership between the U.S. Departments of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. The Housing and Services Resource Center fosters cross-sector partnerships between the organizations and systems that provide housing resources and homelessness services healthcare and mental health services, independent living services, and other supportive services. The HSRC is part of an interagency initiative to streamline and expand access to affordable, accessible housing and the critical services that make community living possible. We leverage our technical assistance resources to help support states and communities and territories and tribal organizations um, in their efforts to help people get get and, and continue to be stably housed and with the services that they need so they can live full lives in the community. 
After the webinar, I hope you will look at the HSRC website at acl.gov forward slash H-O-U-S-I-N-G-A-N-D-S-E-R-V-I-C-E-S or acl.gov forward slash housing and services. And later in the webinar, we will share our new HSRC focus area on traumatic brain injury, which we will continue to update and expand throughout the year as more resource, resources become available. Next slide. Please close the poll. Okay, let's see here. It looks like the majority of people on the call are, are from organizations that partner with agencies that provide services and supports to individuals with, with traumatic brain injury and also organizations that partner with housing agencies that provide supportive housing for individuals with TBI. So thank you so much for responding to the poll. We do have a nice cross-section of, of individuals participating. Let's see here. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today. Our first presenter is Mr. Jeff Larkham. Mr. Jeff Larkham is a gentleman with a traumatic brain injury. Our second presenter will be Ms. Caitlin Sinkovic, a consultant at the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators. And our last presenter will be Ms. Michaela Gray, who is Vice President of Operations at the Brain Injury Alliance in Colorado. Each of them have a unique experience and insights to share. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Mr. Jeff Larkham. Jeff is a gentleman, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Jeff is a gentleman with a brain injury. Hi, Jeff. Hello. He's, he's going to share his story um, to help us understand what it's like to live with a traumatic brain injury and to learn strategies we can use to support people with traumatic brain injuries. Um, so Jeff, thanks so much for being here and sharing your insights and experience with us. So can you tell us, like, what is it like to live with a traumatic brain injury? <laughs> um, it's, well, it's very frustrating. Um, I've, I've noticed that a lot of um, what I've read about it goes um, sort of hand in hand with people with chronic pain or chronic illness, that type of stuff. Um, the idea of limited um, uh, limited energy, you have to be really careful about planning your day um making sure that you don't overtax yourself um lots of organization uh, i don't know what i would do without my phone technology use it as often as possible those types of things um but it's it's mostly um i think just um for me anyways uh, a lot of a lot of the the downsides of it is that it's an unseen um especially for me um a lot of the people that i know from from support groups and whatnot um i know that i'm on the less catastrophic end and um so externally it, it doesn't seem you know it's, it's not easy to see uh, one of my favorite comments is that i've had people say it's like well you you're, you seem really intelligent you must have been really smart before the brain injury <laughs> and um so it, I, I i and i get that a lot um so it's it's there is a lot of where you have to educate people that, that it, it didn't knock iq points off of me um a lot of stuff is executive functioning um being able to um, um i guess it's more endurance than anything I, I can still do a lot. I still have the same brain power, but I can't. I can't go for twelve hours like I used to before. Now it's it's very limited, um, and it takes up a lot more energy. I find myself off in the weeds, trouble with word retrieval, um, and and it's not always predictable. I'll have good days. I'll have bad days. Um, 
So it's it's oftentimes hard to explain to people what I might need in any given moment. Um, that, yeah. <laughs> that that's real helpful, and that must be um, challenging. Um, and so, what are things that you do or people have done that that have helped you um, with some of these um, experiences that you have? Um, well, unfortunately. <laughs> The, the way I came about my, my initial injury was just back in 1991, and I didn't, um, I wasn't diagnosed at the time. I, I just, um, I was one of those who just poo-pooed it and like, you know, just a, um, a concussion, no big deal. Um, and so I went back and actually, um, I was going to school at the time, wasn't able to return to school because of the brain injury. <laughs> um, so I ended up having to basically create a whole new career, um, which I did relatively successfully. Um, but I, I noticed that over the years, I would, I would find workarounds, I would find things that allowed me to function, allowed me to succeed, and they would work for a time and then they would stop working. And so I have to find new workarounds and that cycle kept spiraling. It was, it was a much shorter cycle uh, until eventually um, the workarounds weren't working. And that's when I had um, what, as I understand it's called a late onset um, event, uh, which is basically like having the injury all over again. Um, and pretty much everything I had learned over the past 10 years, uh, the career I had built just disappeared. I, um, I was a computer programmer to make, make it the shortest possible. Um, and I was looking at my code and I didn't understand it. And I thought I was losing my mind. I checked myself into Harding. Thank goodness OSU here in, in uh, Central Ohio, they have a, a really good, um, um, they call it the protocol for for detecting it. They they figured it out really quick. Um, uh, but unfortunately, at that time, uh, Brain Injury Association of Ohio was struggling. And um, I guess long and short of it is, I ended up having to do a lot of stuff on my own. So I haven't really had. I didn't have the traditional um, aftercare. I didn't have any services. I don't have a case manager. I don't. I, I, I'm pretty much on my own, and um, I also um, don't have um, a family that that, that helps. Or um, so I've I've had to navigate this pretty much solo, um, and that has been a huge problem because I do tend to fall through a lot of cracks. Yeah, um, thank, thanks for sharing that. When we had talked to you, had mentioned about using ways. Oh my gosh, yes. I use ways for every, everybody makes fun of me because I use it just even going to the store, I mean, down the street, uh, anything I can do to, to offload just so I don't have to think about it. Um, anything like that. Um, most people would think that, that was, that's just ridiculous. It's like the same thing over and over again, but it's one less thing for me to think about. And especially if there's, you know, the, um, uh, I'm trying to think traffic and all that kind of stuff. It helps avoid all that. So, you know, technology is, I rely on that heavily. Uh, like I said before, I, I couldn't, I couldn't survive without my calendar, my phone, my alarms. Um, I, it, it takes, it takes a lot of organization and planning uh, because without a career, without work, you know, there's no external structure. It's all, you have to create it yourself. Um, and that's, that's the other frustrating thing that we'll, we'll probably get into eventually, but as far as housing and, and, and stuff like that is having no control over your income. You know, if you want, if you want a nicer place, you can't, I can't, you know, um, uh, work extra, at least there's no simple path to, to working extra because if I, if I do any kind of work, then I lose benefits and it, it's that whole cascade. So it's, um, Um, Sorry, went that, off. That, no, that's okay, <laughs> Jeff. I think too, one of the other things you had mentioned is that 
um, about assistance and accommodations and he used the testing example when we had talked earlier. Yeah, this this is one of the things that, that I think um, I've noticed a lot of times that when I do ask for or when when people do help me, um, they they feel like that they're not doing anything or they're like, well, I, you know, you seem you, you did fine. You didn't you didn't need my help. You didn't need. And it reminded me of when I was going to school. I had just been diagnosed uh, with learning disabilities, yeah, um, autism, ADHD. Uh, and one of the, one of the things that I was uh, given was time and a half on my tests. And it made such a huge difference for me. But the trick, the, the funny thing was, is I never used it. Just knowing I had it, I didn't have the stress. And so I, I never needed the extra time. Whereas without that extra time, I would always find myself at the end not being able to, you know, I'm still, I still have answers to write down and I'm, you know, I'm panicking and going through. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's one of those where oftentimes when you have the assistance that you need, it looks like you don't need it. Um, and, and that I think can be very, very tricky sometimes for for um, for an outsider because they're like, you're you're fine, you're doing great. Now, the fact that you were here is why I was fine. That's that's really helpful to to hear. Yeah. Um, and then you also mentioned a guardian angel. Oh, yes. Um, again, back to the falling through the cracks and whatnot. I, um, I've been trying to find a um, case manager or anybody to, because that's, that's the other thing when I, um, most of my information comes from um, support groups, you know, talking to um, other, other survivors. And um, it, it is it's a little frustrating because oftentimes their their initial responses will just ask the case manager you know don't your people do that for you don't you you know and I'm like I don't I don't have that I I did find a a, a kind soul that works for Franklin County um, Department of Health and she's just one of those people who um you know if if she doesn't know she'll try and find out she has no special training no no anything it's it's just the effort she just she's willing to um it's like whatever you know uh, do i need to call you do i need to remind you do you want me to go with you to fill that out yeah um and and that has made all the difference in the world in in uh especially when i was on the verge of um going into a shelter or you know when when i really thought um yeah when i was really panicked it was it was um and that's the other thing is when 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 things get stressful like that that's when especially for people like me with executive functioning issues um we, we tend to shut down um and and we're, we're stuck in the water it really is like having uh, one foot nailed to the floor you just feel like you're just walking around in circles and you can't get anywhere so yeah i um I'll, I'll, a lot of times all it takes is is somebody who's who's patient um uh, and who's willing to listen that's that's another thing i think um depending on the person and their their brain injury and their level of communication i know i am so blessed in in my ability to communicate um compared to some of my uh, some of my friends and um you know it's it's not it's not about ability again it's it's about getting getting your ideas and your thoughts across that barrier and i'm really lucky that i that i have that and it's one of the reasons i'm here today just i i feel that that's that's like my responsibility um because i know how frustrating that is um not not to be able to, um, but oftentimes we are very careful about choosing our words. So um, sometimes it's 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 and the people that that will that will listen carefully is a wonderful thing too. Well, well, Jeff, I want to thank you for sharing um, just a, a a small portion here of the great advice that you have to share with us. It's so helpful 
actually hear it. The chat has been active. People love ways. And they also <laughs> indicated that they've heard that statement that just having someone there can be really helpful or knowing that you have extra time, even if you never use it, helps take some of the pressure off. Um, and the importance of listening yeah. and people being patient. So thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, and we're going to, um, Jeff will be back later to respond to some questions. And now we're going to shift over to Ms. Caitlin Sinkovic to hear more about the prevalence of people with TBI or at risk for or experiencing homelessness and the programs and services available to support them. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and I really appreciate being in here. This really is an intersection of things that I find really important, both in my role with the National Association for State Head Injury Administrators and also with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. And thank you, Jeff, for getting us started off, because I think that's really important, um, providing that individualized story around some of this larger scale things that I'm going to go into next. So when we're really, my focus here is talking about the intersection of brain injury and homelessness. And so I wanted to start out just with some level setting when we're talking about homelessness, what are what do we mean? What are we saying? Um, and I'm providing some definitions. So on this screen here is sort of what is identified by the housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, around who is considered homelessness by their definition and standards. And that's going to include folks who might be living in shelters or in missions, staying in their vehicles or outside or abandoned buildings, other structures that are not meant for human habitation or occupancy. Um, that also includes folks staying in encampments, which we're seeing are a lot more visible now across different communities, and people who might be staying in single room occupancies or hotels or motels, just kind of buying one night or a week's worth of time when they have income to do so. And so these are the folks that meet that federal definition by HUD. Next slide. And then for the housing, there's other definitions of homelessness by other federal departments, such as um, Health Services and Resource Administration, or HRSA. And that definition is a little bit more expansive and includes folks that are staying in transitional housing who might be exiting incarceration or treatment. And that treatment can include things such as subacute rehab or other services that folks who might uh, go into after experiencing a brain injury. It also includes people who are living in permanent supportive housing or who are staying with others doubled up. So their name is not on the lease. They're staying in this residence, but their tenancy is not guaranteed. Maybe they're paying a little bit of money, but there's not a lease with their name on it that would protect their renters' rights um, or folks that are at risk of homelessness. And I'm sharing out these definitions because I think it's really important to note that people are going to qualify for different supports and services based on what their homelessness looks like or what definition that they meet. So somebody who is doubled up, like staying with others, does not necessarily qualify for the same housing vouchers or homeless services that somebody does when they're staying in a shelter. Those definitions are different. So when you're navigating services for folks, it's really important to one document what's happening with the person, but also be clear and understand um, what services might be available based on what their current state of homelessness is. And unfortunately, that means that can exclude some folks who do not have stable housing from different eligibilities or different services because of that. Next slide. I also wanted just to provide a definition of brain injury. So when we're talking about this, we're all on the same page around what that is. There's two different types of brain injury. One is an acquired brain injury, which is an injury to the head um, that is not hereditary. So something that the person is not born with. Um, usually these results from something such as a stroke, which is probably the most common type of acquired brain injury. We also have things which are a traumatic brain injury, which is um, a sort of a blow to the head that alters brain function. So this can be oftentimes from a hit on the head, a car, a motorcycle accident, a bike accident. Those are external forces to the brain that cause the injury versus more of an internal force. In general, we use the term brain injury to encompass both acquired brain injury and traumatic brain injury. Um, but just like the definitions of homelessness, it's important to note that the different definitions of brain injury might then make the person eligible or ineligible for different services in your community or state. Some programs and services might only focus on traumatic brain injury or only focus on acquired brain injury. And so again, that might limit what somebody is able to access um, in terms of their services. Next slide. 
So when we're thinking about folks who are at risk for brain injury, right, sort of engagement in daily life makes us all at risk for brain injury. If you enter a car, ride your bike, things like that. But there are populations that we know experience significantly increased risk of brain injury. And these populations include people experiencing homelessness, survivors of domestic violence, those who have been incarcerated or engaged with the criminal justice system, in general, adults living in poverty, also adults living in rural and frontier communities, especially lower income areas, um, those who are veterans or active um, in the military, and people who are using drugs and alcohol. And these are separated out as to different populations, but there's a lot of intersections among these individuals. And oftentimes folks may cycle between the criminal justice system and homelessness um, and other services and sources. So people may have multiple risk factors that are putting them at risk for a brain injury. Next slide. Um, this is a really important statistic that I like to point out that when the research looked into folks experiencing brain injury and homelessness, 50 to 90 percent of those experiencing homelessness had their first TBI before they became homeless or their experience of marginal housing. So I think that's really critical and important to identify that brain injury is not just a result of homelessness and the vulnerabilities of being unhoused, but actually may also be a risk factor. Next slide. And so the data is not um, completely clear cut as to why that is, um, but I think Jeff's story was a really uh, great way to highlight what that can look like for a potential person, right? So after experiencing a brain injury and maybe not immediately, and, and maybe if the um, impacts of it are not immediately noticeable, people will then return to their daily lives and find that they're not able to do the same things that they need um, that they were before the brain injury. And this might result in having decreased income and not able to return to work or previous levels of employment. They might require more community supports and services, which may not be accessible uh, depending on the socioeconomic standing of their family support systems or connection to support systems. We also have a significant lack of affordable and accessible housing across all communities that people are unable to get housing that they need in the income that they have. Um, and then people may have cognitive deficits. Again, Jeff spoke to these executive functioning issues that are undetected, especially at time of injury, and people therefore may not get treatment or supports for those deficits. Next slide. And then additionally, once people are experiencing homelessness or housing instability, it can be even more difficult to transition out of homelessness into housing when there is an existence of a TBI. So our systems are very complicated and very variable, and it can be really challenging to navigate, especially when people have decreased cognition. We know that homelessness decreases health of people experiencing homelessness, um, and people will experience worth health, cognition, and function after long periods of homelessness. Um, again, there's a lack of affordable and accessible housing for people to even move into, even if they have some connection to services and resources. A lot of shelters and services are not equipped to accommodate folks who have a brain injury. And these restricted environments, lack of access to resources and ability to day-to-day -day routines really prevents people from being able to maintain self-care and functional skills. Um, additionally, then, when there is known history of brain injury, people might make assumptions around whether or not they're able to live independently. So they may say, oh, there's a brain injury, a cognitive impairment. I don't know if they can live in their own housing. And so people might qualify for resources, and then there, there are concerns about that. And what we see happening when that happens is folks stay homeless longer um, and they uh, do, don't move out of systems. And in, unfortunately, in some cases, people never access housing because the right available supports are not there and they remain unsheltered and on the streets, unfortunately, until they experience early mortality. So it's a really significant concern, um, especially when we have histories of brain injury. Next slide. And just to emphasize this point, the research that we do have shows that people with cognitive impairment are more likely to spend more time unhoused than those who do not have a cognitive impairment. And this is looking at all folks experiencing homelessness. So we can really see the outcomes of when we don't tailor and adapt our services and systems for people with brain injury and cognitive impacts in order to be able to help them successfully transition. Next slide. Um, so what do we do about this? I have just a couple of minutes before I turn it over to Michaela, who's going to do a great job of, of sharing about what these programs can be. Um, but we first want to really focus on prevention. So when somebody experiences a brain injury, we want to assess and screen for what their social determinants of health are to identify what services and resources they might need. We don't want to assume that people have caregivers and family supports that are able to comp 
compensate for that lack of income, changes in housing, changes in function. That might not exist for everybody. And we need to know that at time of, of injury and when we're making that post-acute plan of care. We also need to assess and address cognition and executive functioning so that those deficits don't go unnoticed and that the person then goes back to regular life and is really struggling. We want case management supports early to help mitigate housing um, instability and changes in income and start the process to get some of those supplemental resources right away so that people don't fall into homelessness first. Um, and we really need to change our models of care, our traditional institutional medical settings to be more applicable and supportive for those who don't have support systems and caregivers. When we're thinking about response, when somebody has become unhoused and there is a brain injury, we really need to screen for brain injury and homeless services. There are also a large number of people who have a brain injury that was undiagnosed or they never sought medical care who've been living with the effects of that. We wanna screen and identify who has a brain injury and who might need different supports and services. We want to make sure that those services are brain injury informed so that our systems and people are able to navigate them and are supportive for people who have any sort of cognitive or behavioral effect of their brain injury. This is going to require collaboration of our homeless services, our brain injury services, our housing services to really wrap around and streamline how people get to those services um, and make it easy for people to find the help that they need and get the supports they need before they transition into housing and once they have transitioned into housing. Um, and finally, we wanna make sure that folks who are unhoused and experiencing a brain injury have access to services from medical care to case management that are gonna address those effects of brain injury, especially if they haven't had an opportunity to do so um, at any other point in their medical care. So I'm gonna pause there and I believe I'm transitioning it now to Lori. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was great information. Before we move on to Michaela Gray in Colorado, we'd like to ask our audience a question. So if we can go to the next slide. Please place in the chat your answer to this question. What preventative or response service, responsive service might your agency be able to provide to individuals with TBI? And if you can put your answers in the chat. And we're going to turn next to Michaela Gray. Please join me in um, welcoming Michaela Gray to provide an overview of Valor on the Facts and her experiences in Colorado. Michaela? Hi there. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I could talk about Valor on the Facts all day. So this is going to be a quick little overview, um, but I'm always happy to, to answer more questions. So Valor on the Facts is a 72 unit um, housing program in Denver. So it is located in Denver, Colorado. Um, we believe that it is the first of its kind in this nation. Um, it really focuses on the connection, right, that we've been talking about this entire time. So the connection between those experiencing homelessness and brain injury. Um, so when we initially kind of came up with the, the project, we were thinking, you know, we know that a lot of our survivors are out on the streets. How can we focus on getting them housed and having them remain housed? So permanent supportive housing is a huge focus here. Um, permanent supportive housing, of course, means that we're hoping folks can live here as long as they would like. Um, it's not rapid rehousing. And supportive, of course, means that there are services on site, which I will dive into a little bit more. Um, next slide. So it takes a village, which I'm sure is not surprising, especially um, kind of at the magnitude that this project is at, you know, 72 units is massive. Um, but here's a long list of some of the partners that we connected with. A big, I think, important fact here is that we really identified organizations that were already in the community that we could really leverage their knowledge and expertise to make this project happen and be successful. Um, a few of the organizations that I'd like to point out, um, one is Brothers Redevelopment. So Brothers Redevelopment is um, a pretty big agency in the Denver metro area. It creates a lot of our affordable housing programs in the Denver area. Um, so they actually own the property and they are our property management team. So we work very, very closely. Um, we could not do it with um, I also want to point out Shopworks Architecture here, which I'll dive into a little bit more. But Shopworks Architecture um, already had a trauma-informed architect on staff. 
So once again, right, identifying those partners in the community that already exist and really leveraging their knowledge. Um, so we had them bring in their trauma-informed eye, and they designed the whole building, which is pretty amazing, all seven of those specifics. Um, and then also, I, of course, want to always point out the connection that we have with the housing authorities. Um, so the local housing authorities played a huge part in this project and still do to this day. Um, something that was really important for us was connecting with them really early on for this project, informing them about brain injury, right, and some of the, some of the things that we might see with the referrals that we receive. Um, you know, we talked about adding a brain injury specific screening question on their tool that they use um, to identify those experiencing homelessness, um, which is called the VI SPDAT here. I don't know what it's called in, in other states. Um, but so, you know, identifying that brain injury question, and they were very happy to put that on their screening tool. Um, and then talking about referrals, right? That referral process is not always the easiest thing for anybody and to navigate kind of this, this whole realm of housing. Um, but especially some folks that are experiencing symptoms due to their brain injury. So letting them know, right, that when we get a referral, we're going to work extra hard to contact those brain injury survivors, make sure we're getting the forms out in every way, shape, or form that we can. Um, so, you know, mail, um, email, snail mail, whatever it kind of takes, um, and giving folks a little bit of extra time to respond. Um, so those are some partners that I want to identify from this list, but we couldn't have done it without this, this entire community. Next slide. So some qualification criteria to get into Valor on the facts. And I might start saying Valor, it's kind of a natural thing. We call Valor for short. Um, but so column A here are some of the HUD requirements that of course we had to follow, right? So that kind of median income, um, they cannot be on the sex offender registration um, form because we do have kiddos living in the building. Um, they can't have meth production on government housing um, property. They can't have a homicide within 10 years or an arson within five years. So those are kind of those typical HUD standards um, that we, you know, we, we have to honor. But then list B is kind of interesting and special to this specific project. So list B here, column B here, really talks about what we identified as being important for this specific um, this specific residence. So we worked a, pre a preference point system out. So individuals can get between one to seven points. Um, and really the points focus on a lot of other intersections that we might see with those experiencing homelessness, as well as brain injury. So, you know, maybe somebody has a history of domestic violence. Um, maybe somebody has legal system involvement, right? We know that a lot of our folks can be wrapped up in the legal system. Um, maybe we know that they're um, dealing with substance misuse, right? Um, so we kind of take into account some of those points and think, well, we really want this individual to be in supportive housing, right? That support is really important. Um, so we created that preference point system. Um, we do, uh, you know, kind of prioritize those with disabilities. Um, we cannot specifically look for individuals that have a brain injury, um, so we technically can accept anybody with a disability. However, right, we provide brain injury specific support on site, so therefore we want to select folks that would benefit from our brain injury services, um, so we have to take that into consideration. Um, we are looking for folks that are chronic or literally homeless. Um, so, you know, we were looking for folks that are a year or more um, kind of out on the streets or unhoused. Um, and then once we, we feel like we, you know, we're able to move in a lot of the folks experiencing chronic homelessness, we then shifted our gears to looking at literal homelessness, right? Um, so could have recently been experiencing homelessness. But that was a huge focus of ours because if somebody is experiencing, you know, chronic homelessness, then maybe that means that they would benefit from PSH, permanent supportive housing, because of those supports, right? Maybe they, they couldn't get housed um, previously and maintain housing because they're really needing a lot of those, those services on site. Um, and then once again, the alignment with our services. So really specific kind of brain injury services on site. And we want to make sure that, um, you know, folks feel like they can utilize those services and that it benefits them. Um, an important thing to note here is individuals do not have to engage in our services at all. Um, so folks can move in and see it as just their apartment, right? And they can kind of come, you know, in and out as they wish and never engage in our services. 
but we are there if anybody wants to. So that's a that's, um, pretty big question. Next slide, please. Um, so who are we, right, at Valor on the Facts? Um, we're a pretty large community. So I mentioned 72 units, but those are all one to three bedrooms. Um, so about 125 people currently make up the community at Valor, all the way from twin newborns um, to, you know, residents in their 70s. Everybody, of course, brings unique experiences. So, um, you know, some folks have, like I already mentioned, different links of homelessness. Um, so they bring that unique experience in, but they also can bring in a ton of other unique lived experiences. So it's a, it's a really amazing community. Um, we're starting to see natural people kind of step up and take lead. Um, and Ken is one of our, our famous residents. Um, he did approve for us to put his picture up, um, but we love Ken. He does, um, he's just, he's a strong leader in the community. Um, it, it's been really cool to see him kind of flourish in this environment. Next slide, please. So I mentioned brain injury specific services on site, right? That is what makes it permanent supportive housing. Um, so here's a list of some of the services that we do provide on site. Um, so it's really important to know that individuals, like I already mentioned, can engage in services by choice. So not, not a requirement of living in Valor on the Facts. Um, but we do offer a really wide range of services in someone's environment, right? So we do have classroom areas where we can hold classes and workshops that are all focused on wellness. Um, we do have resource navigators that work the front desk. Um, they're there in case anybody needs assistance like application um, completion, um, you know, finding resources in the community, et cetera. Um, and the list kind of goes on and on. But something that was also important to us was that individuals can get out into their community, right? Um, it's amazing to have services on site, but it's also important for people to integrate into the larger world. So our resource navigation team really does a great job at if somebody comes down and says, hey, you know, I'm looking for a support group offsite, or I'm looking for a medical professional, you know, um, that takes my insurance and, you know, is, is across the city or something. Our resource navigation team can always find them those resources, but not only find them the resources, they can do warm handoffs, they can complete the applications needed to engage in those services and help them find transportation to those programs, services, et cetera. Um, something else that's really kind of important to note is Valor on the Facts was built um, close to bus stations. Um, so our resource navigators can help people understand the, the um, bus schedule, which can be tricky in itself, um, but they can also provide free bus passes. We do apply for, for grants and scholarships to get some bus passes that we can hand out to our folks um, and really help problem solve, right? Maybe somebody, the bus isn't the best system for them. How can we problem solve and find a different form of transportation? Next slide. Um, so I already touched on this, um, but we really took into account, right, um, folks that were experiencing homelessness as well as brain injury. And this is really where the trauma-informed design comes in. So, you know, when, when thinking about trauma-informed design, we have to take into account, um, you know, current, uh, you know, threats as well as perceived threats. So we want folks to feel safe at all times from, from you know, actual danger in the moment, but also we don't want them to have to feel like danger could be around that corner, right? Um, so we took into uh, account a lot of different elements here. Um, when it comes to those experiencing homelessness, as well as, um, you know, maybe experiencing brain injury symptoms. Um, and I will dive into that a little bit more. Next slide here. So here are some pictures of our trauma-informed elements. Um, so the first picture has our current um, staff up at the front desk. So those are our resource navigation team. Um, you can see that they're actually behind two locked doors. So they're always keeping an eye on who comes in and out to really provide that extra level of perceived safety, right? Knowing that there's locked doors, um, knowing that somebody's kind of gauging who is coming in and out, uh, maybe, you know, identifying who shouldn't be there, right? Um, they're also always available. Um, so if our residents have those kind of things, they can come down and ask for it. It was really important for us to get brain injury specific staff to be watching the building um, and assisting and providing those services opposed to uh, security guards, right? 
Our staff are trained in brain injury. They understand the symptoms. They know what they're looking for, and they're really good at de-escalation. Um, middle picture here is actually outside of one of the laundry facilities. Um, so it's a cozy little area where somebody can sit and watch three movies back to back. And somebody might say, why is that important? Um, that's important because um, individuals oftentimes can get their items stolen on the streets. So we got a lot of feedback when designing the building like, hey, I would never throw in my laundry and just leave it, right? I want, I want kind of that line of sight on it at all times while I'm waiting for that, that washer to end. Um, so we definitely took that into consideration and created a cozy little space where folks can watch, you know, full length movies back to back if they would like, but keep an eye on their items. Um, and the third picture here shows some of our lighting, dimmable lighting. So we really took into account light sensitivity for, um, you know, brain injury survivors and the symptoms they might be experiencing. And we have a lot of rocking chairs. This yellow one is one of them. Um, I love them. But a lot of rocking chairs throughout the building um, because rocking naturally kind of soothes, right? Soothes the soul a bit. Um, it can really naturally de-escalate a situation and make individuals feel calm. So we took in a lot of those elements. Next slide here. Um, some, some amazing examples. I could talk on this all day, but I won't talk your ears off. Um, but one that I really want to touch on is this first picture here with the hallway. Um, so once again, that perceived safety. So we have folks, right, that um, can see the entire hallway when they step out. So that line of sight, really, really important. Um, we also have little memory nooks to assist folks in identifying their room. Um, so maybe they don't remember their room number, but they can put a nice little um, uh, something personal to them within that nook so that they can identify. And the picture right below is an elevated outdoor space elevated because we want people to enjoy the outdoors, but not feel like they have to engage um, with whatever might be happening on the streets, right? Maybe they still have friends that are out on the streets and, and they're trying to get away from some of those activities. They can still enjoy the outdoor space, but elevated instead of on ground floor. And that is all from me. Well, thank you so much, Michaela. And please join me in thanking Michaela for the overview of Valor on the Facts and sharing her experience in supporting people with traumatic brain injury. Before we move on to the question and answer session, we'd like to hear from you. What is a major trend you are seeing in terms of unmet needs for individuals with traumatic brain injury? Please place your answers in the chat. And we're going to go ahead and bring up the presenters for the question and answer session. Okay, well, first I wanna thank all of you uh, for sharing your stories and your experience uh, with us today. Um, Caitlin, the first question that I have is for you. Uh, what is one key takeaway you hope participants on the call will take with them today? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is just understanding that there is likely a prevalence of brain injury and or housing instability in the programs that you're working with and whatever side you're on. If you're on the housing side and homeless services side, knowing that there are folks with brain injury and if you're in the brain injury world, recognizing that there are probably folks experiencing housing instability. So being aware of that and that I think to me, that's the very first step of being able to build out programs and services and ask really robust questions of folks to get them connected to the resources that they need. Thank you. And Jeff, the next question is um, for you. So in the chat, um, people have said, just want to share my gratitude to Jeff for sharing. Mm -hmm. he, they want you to know that people are rooting for you. And um, and then another um, attendee is asking, you said you didn't understand things you used to work on professionally after your injury or event. Did you find that you also had changes in what motivated you? Yeah, yeah I mean, again, I went, I went through all this stuff. I went through, you know, the rage, the, I mean, I, I really thought I was losing my mind. I really did. I, I had no idea what was going on, uh, especially with the 10 year gap from the from the initial, you know, um, yeah, everything changed. 
I mean, I, I lost everything. Um, I was, I was really at the top of my career. I was kicking butt and taking names. I was doing amazing stuff. I was flying all over the world. It was, it was amazing. And then, I mean, my own work, I didn't, I, I couldn't interpret it. I couldn't figure it out. I, it was just gone. And that, that is, I don't know, but yes, uh, so many things changed. I, I had to, I had to basically re rediscover myself completely. Uh, lost marriage, the whole thing, you know, it just. <laughs> That, that had to be very challenging and and thank you for responding to that question i think it helps us get greater insight to better understand the the people we're working to serve um also i know you mentioned your guardian angel were there others um along the way that that have helped you that come to mind oh well, obviously dr mishu um without him i i would not have figured all this out and and um my tbi doctors um but um honestly I, i'm sitting here getting kind of choked up all the stuff that i'm hearing like with caitlin and kayla and I, i'm sitting here going how, how do i how do i get there how do I? <laughs> I mean that just sounds so wonderful i'm like oh my heavens um uh, but they're but they're hitting on everything, you know, the stuff like, you know, what happens if your family doesn't support you? What happens if what happens? I mean, um, I just love the fact that this stuff is being dealt with. This is this is awesome. I um I just I wish I knew how to how to get into the system now so many years past, because I don't I don't know how to you know, this this stuff should have happened when I had my initial injury. So that's a head scratcher for me. And and Jeff, I think that's a common uh, question that we're hearing from people. And I don't know, Michaela or Caitlin, if you might have a response uh, to that question, like how do how do we help people get more connected to these resources? Yeah, and Jeff, actually, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking of you know one of the things that we always say at the Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado is. One, if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. They're mm -hmm. all so unique. So we need to find services specific to individual folks and trial and error, see what works, right? But also, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, we call it the invisible injury. Um, people, you know, mm -hmm. what we hear every day when people call our main line is I feel like I have to prove that I'm experiencing these things. I feel like I have to prove, right, that I've had a brain injury, especially when it wasn't yeah. diagnosed early on. Um, so I think. You know, of course, if you have a Brain Injury Alliance um, in your state, because I know we're all in different states, um, check with them. Every state has different programs and services under their BIAs. Um, Colorado, we are incredibly lucky. We have pretty robust services, so I couldn't speak specifically to your state, but starting there mm -hmm. could be beneficial. Um, and then also, I think, learning, um, looking for self-advocacy classes. We focus a lot on self-advocacy um, because it takes away a little bit of that anxiety around having to prove, right, that you are experiencing these things and um, that you have gone through these things. And um, once I think, you know, there's some confidence around advocating for yourself, you kind of tackle, you can tackle some of the big organizations um, and feel confident in doing that, right? Asking for services um, and also identifying exactly what you're looking for. Um, so self-advocacy classes are, are a big thing that we look at in Colorado. Um, but Caitlin, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think just from a national perspective, I I see a lot of gaps um, and just a need to bridge and connect services. There's, you know, there's homeless services resources and there's brain injury resources, and they don't always collaborate and talk to each other, right? Or understanding those needs. And so, you know, this doesn't help you, Jeff, immediately or folks who are out there now. But I think for hopefully attendees on this call is a spur to action to build those connections so that you can learn from each other, bridge these resources, make it really easy, like no wrong door. If I walk in for homeless services or I walk in for brain injury services, people are able to identify the needs I have and connect me to what those are. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good 
siloed services and we have a lot of work to do to bring those together because when we do that it really makes it much easier for the folks who need those supports and resources and I think we have some really great emerging models across a couple of different states um, and I'm hoping that we can learn from those and replicate those uh, across the country in addition to continuing to advocate for accessible and affordable housing because there is not enough of that and we're not going to resolve this until we have enough so well Thank you all. And we do have more questions, I, but unfortunately, I don't know that we're going to have enough time to get to them all, but perhaps we can huddle afterwards and try to get answers back to everyone. Uh, one thing I know there's a question about point in time counts, and we're working with our HUD colleagues to see uh, what we might be able to do there. And then also, um, there were some questions too about how some of these programs are funded. So, um, I want to um, thank our panelists uh, for the responses to these questions. And um, now we're going to um, shift over to share and highlight a few technical assistance resources with you. And uh, we'll work on getting answers to those questions we weren't able to respond to now. So first, um, the first resource we want to mention is the Ohio State University's Traumatic Brain Injury Identification Method. And this was developed by Dr. John Corrigan. It's a standard procedure for identifying if an individual has suffered a traumatic brain injury throughout their lifetime. Sometimes an individual is not aware that they've sustained a traumatic brain injury and or are not aware of the long-term effects they may be experiencing. So we'd like to highlight the online training that's available for people who may be working with a person with a traumatic brain injury, and there's no cost for this training. You can access the online training via the hyperlink on the last bullet on this slide, and we'll also place the link in the chat too. And um, these resources are also highlighted. Um, and if we go to the next slide on this um, enhancement that we've made to the Housing and Services Resource Center website. Um, we're excited to announce that we added a traumatic brain injury webpage to the Housing and Services Resource Center website. You can access the webpage by going to the HSRC homepage. Place your cursor on the focus area item in the top bar. A drop down menu will appear. Select traumatic brain injury. And this will take you to our traumatic brain injury um, webpage in, H in the Housing and Services Resource Center website. And um, we'll put the link to this um, page in the Housing Services Resource Center website in the chat too. This web page focuses on resources for individuals with traumatic brain injury and those that serve them. And so please visit this page to access these resources. Some of the resources I'm, I'm going to mention a little bit too are also um, on, available on this website. So this is meant to be a one-stop shop where you can go here to find more resources that can help us in serving people with traumatic brain injury and helping them get stable housing. The next slide. ACL is very engaged with the states and communities in um, addressing, and, and the research community in addressing um, traumatic brain injury. We administer the state traumatic brain injury program. We fund a technical assistance resource center that helps state traumatic brain injury programs promote access to integrated, coordinated services and supports for people with traumatic brain injury, their families and caregivers. We fund institutions of higher education, nonprofit organizations, and other organizations or agencies to provide coordinated systems of rehabilitation care and conduct research on recovery and long-term outcomes through our model systems programs. We encourage you to visit the TBI Technical Assistance Resource Center and to partner with your state TBI program and or a model system grantee. The links on this slide are available in the links document distributed before the webinar and staff will also be putting them in the chat. You can also access these resources through the HSRC TBI webpage. And these are there to help, um, so please um, use them often. <laughs> now, if we go on to the next slide, one last request um, that we'd like you to complete. Uh, we'd like to ask you to please take three minutes to answer our short feedback form. Staff are putting the link in the chat. There are just five questions asking you to rate different aspects of your webinar experience. There's also an opportunity to provide comments if there is more you'd like to share. Please know we read all comments and find ways to act on your input. And it's really helpful to get your feedback. 
You can um, also access the survey at https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash hsrc jan31. We have also learned over the years that we can, if you can um, go on to the next slide. We've also learned over the years that we can learn so much from all of you. Like this was really evident in the chat as you provided your responses. And that is really helpful to us too, because it's clear there's a lot we can be doing and that agencies are doing and can be doing to help support people with traumatic brain injury. So we encourage you to tell us more about your innovations at the Housing and Services Resource Center email, which is hsrc at acl.hhs.gov. You can also send suggestions to us there. And it's through some of these communications that we find these innovations that are happening throughout the country that we can then hold up as examples for others. And so peer-to-peer -peer learning is a key element of how we're going to, over, to be able to address some of the challenges we're confronting around homelessness. We hope that you'll also sign up for periodic Housing and Services Resource Center emails. To sign up, um, please visit https colon forward slash forward slash cloud dot connect dot hhs dot gov forward slash acl dash subscriptions. Um, we send out um, updates and information um, to our email listserv around upcoming webinars, as well as when resources are added to the Housing and Services Resource Center website. We go on to the next slide. Finally, we want to thank our presenters, our ASL interpreters, Ray and Daniel, our CART specialists, Katie and Genevieve, New Editions, US Aging, our colleagues at the Administration for Community Living, the HHS Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, and the U our colleagues at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for their work in developing and providing this webinar. We're especially grateful for everyone who joined today and for the work you do each day to help people at risk of or experiencing homelessness maintain or obtain the housing and services that they need to live full lives in the community. Thank you for your participation today, for sharing um, your, your work and your ideas, and have a great afternoon.